Um, whenever we splint an upper extremity, one of the things we do is a sling and swath. Now, sling and swath go to like peanut butter and jelly. You do one, you do the other. Now, every sling, let me rephrase that, every sling starts the same way. Let's assume that the patient has an injury to his right arm. To do a sling, the first thing I need to do is take my cravat and make it back into a triangle bandage. The right angle, a 90 degree angle, points back towards the patient's elbow. So without patient moving his arm, I use the voids, I tuck the long end in, and I bring it over, and we always start on the uninjured side. If this is the injury, that tail goes to the uninjured side. I then bring the other tail up, cradling the arm, bring it around to the other side, and I simply tie a square knot. I can use the tails of the cravat to pad that knot so there's no pressure against the body, and that's the sling. Now, that's only part of the process going, the sling and swath. The sling will keep the arm from moving up and down, but at least moving down, but it does prevent any side-to-side -side movement. So we need to do that with the swath. We take our cravat, and we need to catch both parts of the arm, the upper arm and the lower arm, Bring it to the side here, again, tie it with a square knot, and there we go. Now by doing that, I've eliminated the, the, the wobbling motion here. Now some folks may, sit, may try to do it, but they only do the upper arm. I've seen people show that. The problem with that is no matter how tight I make that, I still have movement. So, you gotta catch both parts of the arm to eliminate that movement. Okay, now with some injuries, the patient may not tolerate that triangular bandage coming across the shoulder or clavicle area because of where the injury is. In that case, what we're gonna do is a modified sling. Do a modified sling, we start exactly the same way. Remember, every sling starts the same way over the uninjured side. The difference is what I do with this other tail. For example, if the patient had a clavicle injury, I don't want to put pressure with this tail down that clavicle. So what I can do, I take this tail, I tuck it underneath the arm, and then take it over, and I can tie my square knot, like so, come back, I put my swath on again, just like I did before, and now I've immobilized it. In fact, this is the treatment, you just learned one split. This is the treatment for a fractured clavicle. Modified sling and swap. Note that the knots are all to the front of the body so it doesn't dig into the patient's back and they're out of the way. Okay, let's look at some other injuries to the upper extremities. Painful swollen deformed injuries to the extremities, aka fracture. We'll start off, assume the patient has an, an injury to the humerus. Now, how you'll find the patient generally presenting, yeah, the body is a natural splint. Probably you're holding the arm right against, right against his body because that makes it feel better. So if that's what you're looking at, that's what you have to work with. To split that, I need two cravats. Very carefully using the voids of the body so that I'm through the patient, and a very gentle seesawing motion to get it in place. Put the cravat there. Now this whole time you're talking to your patient and you convince them that you know, you're helping them there and all kind of stuff. Now, once I have this in place, I need to take my, my splint. Now, this is, again, a fixation splint. Now, this is a board splint. Far on one side, padding on the other. The padded side goes against the patient. Okay. I see students in class all the time, put it backwards, and I say, what I tell you? All right. the soft side goes against the patient. Now, you're talking to your patient, your patient's constantly, okay, uh, here's what I want you to do, General. Put this in there, hold that for me, just put that right against there. If your patient's conscious alert, put them to work. You're occupying their mind, you're actually treating for shock at the same time you're treating injury. So that gives you an extra hand, it keeps your partner, your partner can do other things to get, get the structure ready wherever you need to do instead of having them hold the board for you. And then all I'm going to do is take my cravats and tie around the board with a nice square knot. Take the ends, tuck them in so they don't get caught in anything. Okay, I need to be above the elbow. Make sure I'm in position here. Again, we don't tie the cravat directly over the injury. That's why 
When we did our patient assessment through point tenderness, we identified the general location of the actual fracture. So we don't tie directly over that. We need to have one tie above it, one tie below it. You want to tie it good and firm. A common thing that, that students do in class, they tie it loose. It should be good and secure. I'll see a lot of times I'll walk around class, somebody ties a splint, and I'll be able to slide my whole hand in there with the patient because you're tying it too loose. It's got to be secure. Okay, we'll look at it for a second now. I got you here. Now, ideally, you get the patient, you talk to them very carefully, just try to give them the bend at the elbow. That's not what the injury is. We need to secure this arm. We need to, if we get him to there, we're good. You may well find him with it already pulled in this way. The last thing we need to do now is sling and swath. Right? The point of splitting, immobilize the broken bone ends and the adjacent joints. We did the bone ends. If we don't do a sling and swath, the adjacent joints aren't immobilized. Okay, the next one we're going to look at is for an injury to the radius of ulna. Again, how are you going to find the patient presenting? It's probably going to be having that arm crowded right against her body. I broke my left wrist one time. And when the squad got there, that's exactly how I was. Again, because the body is a natural spine. So this is what you're looking at. This is how we have to work with. Again, first thing we need, two cravats. Very carefully while I'm talking to the patient, using the void at the elbow, I can slide my cravats into place. One there like that. And then very carefully use the seesawing motion, move the other one into place. Just like so. Now, the general rule of splitting for the upper extremity, one bone, one board, two bones, two boards. That's all one bone humerus, we use one board. Now I got two bones, radius and ulna. I need two boards. So again, sole side goes against the patient. So the first thing I do, again, I talk my patient very carefully. Jump, I'm going to slide this in right underneath your arm here. Just let me get it in. It's going to make it feel a whole lot better. Just like so. I get the first board in, now put the second board in. Now, you can't see this, we'll see in a few minutes. What I've done, when I put that board in place, his fingers are curled over the edge of that board in a position of function. Okay. You don't want to put it in flat like this. If for some reason, because of that injury, he loses function and his hands are frozen that way, there's not as much a, a physical therapist can do. But if they're in a position of function, even if they get stuck that way, they can still hold a pencil, a fork, he can still do things with that. So again, we'll curl the fingers over the edge of the board, get a nice position of function. The other thing I have to look at, as you may say, there may be a gap here. If there's any voids, I may use four by fours, lower boards, whatever, to fill that gap. Because the last thing I want to do is when I tie this tight is to move the bones because it fills that gap. Okay, so I fill all the voids, and very carefully you know, I slide this other board in. You can hold this for me, so the slide right there, that's a hold right nice for me. Now I got my two boards in place. And now I simply take my cravats and tie a nice square knot with each one of them. Nice and secure, not too loose. You gotta be secure enough that it stays and the bones don't move. Again, we gotta immobilize the broken bone ends. Here. Again, we've identified the point of where the injury is to point tenderness on our patient assessment. So we can tie proximal and distal to the injury. I'm not directly over top of it. Like so. And now I've mobilized the broken bone ends. The last piece of this again are the adjacent joints, sling and swath. Okay, now we move down to the lower extremities, proximal lower extremities, and fixation splits for those. Uh, the first one I'm talking about is a fixation split for the femur or the hip. Uh, you may have a situation where you don't have a traction splint available, or it may be an open fracture of the femur, which the traction splint doesn't apply for. Or there may be other associated injuries to the ankle, the, the knee, uh, and you can't use a traction splint. So we need to do a fixation split for the femur. Okay. We're going to assume it's the patient's left leg. Okay, uh, you've got to be presenting with a with a uh, lateral rotation to the foot, the other toes pointing straight up so we identify this injury. And now the first thing we need to do is to put our cravats in place. To do the fixation split for the femur, we want to use a total of seven cravats, if at all possible. We're going to put three on the upper body, two on the upper leg, two on the lower leg. One's going to be right in the, underneath the armpit area, one on the rib cage, one in the hip area, and then two on the upper leg, two on the lower leg. So I need to put three in position on the upper body. We're going to use the void at the small of the back to do that. An easy way to slide these in place, take your three cravats, lay them right on top of each other, take a medium-sized splint, 
Just put the tail over the top of it and very carefully, so you don't have to move the patient, use the small of the back, and very carefully just slide it to the small of the back. Once you get to the other side, there are your three tails, hold on to them, slide that splint back out, and now they're underneath the patient. And very carefully now, I take one at a time and seesaw them back and forth until I get them where I need them to be. Okay. In this case, we're talking about an injury to the femur, so I need it in the hip area. I need one all the way up as high as I get underneath the arm, and then one on the lower rib area, like so. The lower extremity, I need two in the upper leg and two in the lower leg, so I gotta take two together. I can use the void at the knee, and pass that through. And keep in mind, again, in, in real life, Exposed to examine, this panel leg will be going, so it'll be much easier to see what we're doing here. Again, seesaw motion, get this in position, up high on the, on the leg, just proximal to the knee. Take a third one and through the knee and bring it down distal to the knee. And then I can use the void the ankle. to get the last one in place, just like so. Once I get my cravats in place, now I'm ready to get my boards. Now, with my boards, I want the long board on the outside of the body to go all the way from the armpit to just below the foot. I need it to exceed below the foot so I can immobilize the whole thing. So I can take my board and I can see if it's long enough. In this case, it is. If it wasn't long enough, I had somebody real tall there, I can simply take another board, put it with it, tie two cravats on it, now I got a real long board. But in this case, we're lucky. Uh, this board is the right size for this patient. We're good. So we put that in place. Okay. Okay. Now, what we want to do is take a cravat, some kind of padding, put that over the end of the board that's up in the arm area so that it doesn't cause any discomfort or further injury. I now need a medium sized board which will go between the legs. Yeah. Take another cravat and use that as padding and very carefully position that between the legs. Both these boards have to come down below, below the foot. Now, one thing you'll notice because of the lateral rotation to the foot, we have a problem with the splinting here. In real life, this actually takes two EMTs to apply the splint. What we need to do is get the position, the foot back into a position of function. To do that, one EMT would take gentle traction. This is not traction like a traction splint. This is just gentle traction, enough to get the toe to align with the nose and maintain it there so we can bring the boards in next to the patient. And the one EMT would stand here and hold it just like that. Now, once we get that in position, I gotta look. I got a void here at the knee area. I got a void at the upper body area. I need to fill those voids. I take a towel, I put that right position here to fill the void. Right? I do the same thing up in the upper body area. Right? If I have a void the ankle, I got to fill all the voids. Yeah. Once I have that all in position, there's a specific order to tie these cravats. The first cravat we want to tie is one all the way to the top to anchor that long board so it doesn't go anywhere. Again, I'm working opposite myself. I would normally be on that side of the patient. And I tie this with a square knot. If I get the board anchored, I need to tie distal and proximal, distal and proximal to the injury. In this case, we're saying it's a femur fracture, so distal and proximal, or proximal and distal, doesn't make any difference, either side of the fracture, to mobilize that. Again, use a square knot.
And then once I have it secured distal and proximal to the injury, I work distal and proximal. Save time, I'm not going to tie every knob, but I would tie the one around the ankle next. I tie the one just below the knee next, hip area, and then the lower rib cage area. And then the thing is completely secure. Again, that was a spot for a, a fixation spot for the femur. If we had injury to the lower leg, could we use this same splint? Of course we could. Because what's it doing? It's immobilizing the broken bone ends and the adjacent joints. It's a little bit of overkill. I don't need to go over the armpit with that. If it was a lower leg, I could do the same thing, only stop in the splint, just high on the upper leg, and just use fork or bats. In that case, I would tie either side of the injury, distal and proximal. All right, so we can use this. A little bit of overkill. We use a medium sized split on the outside for a lower leg if we need it. We can also use this if we have an injury to the knee. There's three ways we can actually see the knee present to us. The first way is picture this the guy slides into second base, you get there, his leg straight out like that. It's the same situation as if it was a lower leg. Two boards, either side of the injury, in this case, either side of the knee, distal proximal. And that's one way we can secure the knee. Okay, let's look at the second situation we have in the knee. In this case, he slipped to second base, and he injured his knee. But when you get there, his knee isn't flat on the ground. There's a slight angulation, a slight bend to the knee. Well, two boards running parallel to the ground are not going to secure that knee. So we need to do something a little bit different with that. What I've done, I put the four cravats in place, because we're still going to use four cravats, two in the upper leg, two in the lower leg. But now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my board, and we're going to bring it in, and it's going to go underneath that leg from up by the ischial bone, down past the heel. Okay, this is a two EMT operation at this point. What's going to happen is very carefully, we get it all in place, one EMT is going to come and take a hold of the leg and very carefully, without bending a knee, lift it just enough so that board can slide underneath it. The second EMT will then take the board and slide it in place all the way, and then we can rest that leg right on that board. Once that's in place, I've got a void here that I need to fill. So I can take a blanket, I can take some towels, whatever is necessary to completely fill this void so that when I tie it down, there's no movement. Once I have all the void filled, I got a void here at the ankle. I probably put a, a towel like that as well. Now I tie it, use the square knots, distal and proximal to the injury first and then distal to proximal. And now with a slight angulation to the knee, we have it secured. Okay, the third situation with a knee injury would be we have a large bend in the knee where you, you obviously can't use this two straight boards and it's too big a gap to fill it and put the board underneath. So what we're gonna do now is an A-frame split. Now the same split can also be used on an angulated elbow. I want to demonstrate that knee because it's a little bigger and it's easier to see. To do the A-frame, you need two on the knee, you need two medium-sized boards and three cravats. What you do with the first cravat is just gently put it in place, just set it there. And now you take your two other your two splints, get pat inside against the patient's leg, one on either side, and you make an A. This first cravat is just wrapping around the two boards. I got around this side. And it's doing basically it's doing two things. The first the, the primary thing it's doing is holding two boards together. But at the same time, it is starting to give some stability to the joint. Now, the next two cravats are tied exactly the same way. One on one side of the board and one on the other side. The important thing we have to do is tie the board together and also incorporate that limb. If we don't incorporate the limb, then the, the splint's not going to be secure. So the simplest way to tie this, you take your cravat and wrap around the leg. I now have the limb involved. It's, it's, it's already in, in, the, in the splint. You leave enough tail so I can tie a knot, 
I have my long tail, I'm going to do all the work with my long tail. And what I'm going to do is go around these boards and make a nice figure eight around the end of the board and take it right up against the leg, bring the two tails together on the outside of the board and tie it in a nice square knot. Again, tuck the ends in. I take my other cravat and I do the exact same thing on this other end. First, I got the leg involved in the tie, leave enough tail to tie a knot, and then make a figure eight around the end of the board, bringing the cravat right up against the leg so it's nice and secure in there. Just like that. Now, the leg is unable to move. It's locked in place. Now, what I want to do once uh, we get a good picture of this is show you why you have to incorporate the leg. If the leg's not incorporated, well, first the leg is incorporated, you can see there's no movement in the leg. That leg can't bend. I'm going to untie this and tie it improperly to show you why you have to incorporate the leg. If I were just to take this cravat, and tie it around the end of the board. The leg is no longer incorporated in the tie. And it ties, no matter how tight I tie it. I'll tie it nice and tight here. Now, because that leg is not incorporated, what can happen is this. The knee can bend. That's why we have to include that leg in that tie. Okay, this is for an angulated knee or for an angulated elbow, it's the same split. Okay, there are other types of splits that can be used as fixation splits. Uh, we read in your book, it talked about vacuum splints, uh, talked about air splints, and other types of splints. Uh, what we have here is a vacuum splint. Oh, again, it's made of plastic, so it's easy to wash. It's got Velcro, it's got a little valve that opens and shuts. Inside, there's little beads that will form fit around the patient's limb. To use this, Again, this one in particular is for, like for a forearm. We put it on the patient just like we would any other splint. Using the Velcro. And then we have to evacuate the air out of the splint, which will then force those beads around the arm. To do that, we hope this little pump up the suction pump and we just start pulling the air out. As we do that, if you look closely you can see the split start to collapse around the limb until we get it so it's secured up and the limb is not going to move. Now we got to be careful we don't make it too tight. We got to again, keep it figure out we can check capillary refill, make sure we still have circulation. Again, that will mobilize the limb. When you get done, shut it off and then you can remove the pump. Okay, one of the types of fixation splints we have in class to work with is made out of neoprene. It's got a steel bar on the end, which makes a fixation splint, and it secures with Velcro. To use this, it's real simple. You un-Velcro, bring out the, underneath the patient's arm, make it good secure, Velcro it, and then sling and swath, and it's immobilized. Okay, we're now going to talk about dislocations to the shoulder. There are four different ways the shoulder can be dislocated, and those are named by the direction that the, the shoulder is dislocated at. Now, the humerus is what is being dislocated. The head of the humerus, whichever direction that goes, that's how it's named. If the head of the humerus comes out of the shoulder and it comes up, that's a superior dislocation. In that case, if the head of the humerus is up, the arm is basically pointing down. If the head of the humerus comes forward, that's an anterior dislocation, and the arm goes to the rear. If the head of the humerus goes back, that's a posterior dislocation, and the arm comes suddenly forward, and if the head of the humerus goes down, that's an inferior dislocation, and the arm is up. Right, people often get confused, they see the direction of the arm, and they, that's how they think the name of the dislocation is, but it's not the direction of the arm, it's where the head of the bone has come dislocated, out of location it's supposed to be in. Now, 
We already know how to treat two of these injuries without even going any further. First, if you had a superior dislocation, well, we actually have two choices. First choice is we could just fill this void and use a series of slots to secure the arm to the body. Of course, if we did that, we now made this person a stretcher patient. They have to lay down a stretcher or walk to the hospital. We can't sit them in, into a seat. Now, if we have multiple patients, that ties up one whole ambulance for us. So, ideally, what we can do is if it's like that, we, there's no injury below the elbow, so we talk to the patient real nice and just real careful, just bend your arm, bend your arm. All I have to do is get past the midpoint, get past the waist. And now I can use a modified sling and swath and immobilize that. Now, you get the person, get the person to bend your elbow, no, I can't, I can't, it hurts, it hurts. Well, you get that kind of objection, then we got to do a series of swaths. But if we can get them to bend it just enough where we can sit them down, sling and, modified sling and swath, then we're good to go. Now, the second dislocation. Shoulder goes to the back. Posterior dislocation. Arm comes suddenly forward. We have the same situation. Very carefully, I can fill any void here, but can you bend the elbow, bend the elbow? Why do you get past the midpoint? Modified sling and swath. And the posterior dislocation is uh, secure. So two out of four, we already know how to treat you before we start talking about it. Now we get into the other dislocations. Uh, look at a situation where we have an inferior dislocation. The head of the humerus down, the arm is up in the air. Well, again, we have a dislocation. That joint is locked. So what we need to do is keep it from any pressure on it so it's moving around. What you do is try to get the patient, if they can bend at the elbow, to rest their hand on top of their head. Now, you reach a point where they say, no, no, it hurts, I can't move it. We take towels, whatever we need to do to fill the void here. Right, but again, for, for demonstration purposes, she's able to bring her hand all the way down to her head. Now, all I have to do is secure that in place. To secure that, I need to take two cravats and just tie them together with a square knot. Now, basically, the reason why I want to do that is I need one long cravat. So I tie two together and I get one long cravat. And the nice part is, remember the knot is, that's the midpoint. Secure this, I'm going to wrap the cravats around the wrist. All the way around one time, and now I can put that knot right on top of the cravat so that it's padded. Leave one tail hanging to the back, leave one tail hanging to the front. Now, start with the tail in the front. I take the tail in the front, I go through this hole, and up over top of the hand, and just let it drop down. I take the tail to the back, I come to the front, and I take it underneath the chin. Once I get to this point, what I have left basically to tie is the lacerated cheek bands we talked about in an earlier lesson. I make the same crisscross right here, eyebrow line, the bump of the back of the head, come around, back up around the wrist. If I have a lot of tail, I can wrap it around the wrist a couple of times so I don't have all that tail hanging and then tie a square knot. Tuck the ends of it. Now that hand is tied in place and that shoulder is locked in place. Okay. The last shoulder dislocation we want to talk about is an anterior dislocation where the head of humerus has come forward, the arm is to the rear. What we need to do is create a package to fill this void and secure the arm to the body. To do that, we want to take a, a blanket and fold it so it's about the same width as the patient's body. If it's too long, it's not going to function right. If it's too short or too narrow, it's not going to function right. So about the patient's body width, and then take four cravats, lay them one right on top of each other at the end of one, and then very carefully, you want to roll this blanket up. So these four cravats are right in the middle of that blanket roll. So you end up with a package that looks like this. My position with the head is forward, the arms back here. I need to make this blanket roll fit that void. So I fit it in there. Now it's a little bit too big, so I can unroll it a little bit, just enough so that it fits in that void. And now this is a specific order we want to tie these cravats. First thing I do is take the, the first cravat. Make sure I have opposite ends of the same cravat by gently tugging on it, just like that. 
and come over here and tie a nice square knot. These first two cravats basically secure this blanket roll to the body. Again, use the tails of the cravat to pad the knot. Take the second cravat. Again, gently tug one, make sure you have the same cravat. And tie it like you're tying a swath. Now we have the blanket roll secured to the body. Now we begin to secure the arm to the blanket roll. The first thing I'm going to do is take the third cravat and secure the upper arm down to the blanket roll. Again, make sure I have the opposite ends of the same cravat. And just bring it over the upper arm and tie a nice square knot. Add the knot. Now I have one cravat left in the blanket roll. I need to take a fifth cravat and tie it over to the fourth cravat because I need one long cravat again. So, anterior dislocation, get the anterior tail and just tie the two cravats together. The square knot. Now, what we want to do, that arm wants to go back, we want to secure it right where it wants to go. So I take this long tail wrap it around the wrist, and then bring it right to the body, right where it wants to go. Come around the patient, and use the void, wrap it around the wrist again. I take the other tail of that long cravat, wrap it around the wrist going the opposite way. And now I have two tails going in opposite directions. Tie a nice square knot. and the arm is secure to the bottom.